No. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Green Software Foundation Houston Regional Event. Good morning. I'm going to be your host, Kyle Keelan. Uh, I run the uh, Houston location for Avanade, uh, as well as our resource portfolio. And I'm really excited to be here with you. Uh, this is definitely a subject that I'm very passionate about. Uh, it's a very important, uh, you know, obviously for the world, but uh, the, the energy industry uh, as, as well. And so I really thank you all for taking the time, you know, both to be here in person with us and virtually uh, to join in on this really exciting event. We've got a host of really great speakers for you today uh, from Accenture, Microsoft, uh, and Shell. Uh, and Avanade, and really excited to, for, to talk to you about the Green Software Foundation and you know, the, some of the technical details behind it um, uh, uh, for, the, for the day. So I wanted to just to start, kind of level set us a little bit of like how important uh, the content of today is uh, regarding sustainability. And so Microsoft had uh, one of their big conferences earlier this week at Envision, and they had sent out a poll and you know, obviously, all of our you know, clients, many companies, are very much uh, you know pushing and, and wanting to to really hit uh, you know net twenty net carbon goals uh, in 2025. But they asked, you know, what are some of your biggest challenges? And over 50% said internal culture change. And I I would say events like today are how we're going to change internal cultures at all of our companies, right? So it's not just about writing green software, but it's about changing the mindset of how important sustainability and being green is within all of our companies. So I wanted to uh, highlight one thing for those that are here in person. This welcome card is actually a seed that you can plant. So you take it home, plant it in your flower garden, and, and I'm, I'm told a flower, depending on how, how good you are at gardening, is going to pop up uh, to kind of commemorate the event. So I thought that was kind of a, a cool thing. Um, and then lastly, you know, for those in person, restrooms are right around here in the hall, and there's emergency exits, uh, you know, right over here. There's a stairwell. Uh, no, no planned um, uh, fire drills or anything like that in the building today. So, all right. So I'm introducing you first, right? Sure. All right. So our first speaker is going to be Marsha Trant. Marsha is the sustainability lead for North America for Avanade. Uh, she's also the regional executive here for the South Region for Avanade, uh, and my, my boss as well. So give her, <laughs> give her a uh, warm welcome. OK. Well, I don't, do I need that? I don't really need um, I'm just going to give a quick introduction. I just wanted to welcome everybody. Um, and as Kyle said, I, I think this is, um, I think sustainability is the issue of our time. Um, I don't talk to any senior executives at any of our clients that this isn't very, very high on their agenda and concern and how they're trying to figure it out. Some of them may not know how it translates into software. So I think we're going to talk about that um, today, and we're going to get a chance. And then hopefully, those of you will take this back to your clients, to your bosses, to your organizations, and help them understand how this can be a really, really important tool. I'm also really, um, I think the Green Software Foundation itself is a great analogy for this problem. This is a problem, you know, sustainability is a problem that's going to take all of us to fix. It's a really big, complex thing. And so we have to think of it in terms of ecosystems. I love that we have you know, competitors and all different kinds of organizations on this Green Software Foundation. And, they're, and I think that's because we're going to need everybody's good minds. You can't just say there's going to be a one technology way that we address this. So uh, I, th I think it's very exciting. I'm proud of the fact uh, of you know, the, the role that Avanade has um, played here and how we have stepped up. But I really am proud for everybody who's here uh, to learn more about this, understand more about how to make it practical. I think the trick on the big topics of sustainability is um, making it real. Because the problem can seem so big and complex that people just get stuck and they don't know where to start. And this is a nice, nice, uh, very pragmatic, concrete way that we can all make a difference. And 
honestly, it's concrete things making a difference of if every human being on the planet starts doing those, that's what's going to get us to the kind of change that we need because it's got to be so systemic. So first of all, I'm just thrilled you're all here. Hope I get a chance to meet and talk with you at some of the breaks. Um, we'll be having more time later. And Kyle, if you want to go through the rest of the agenda. Yeah. So I'm going to introduce the, the first speaker that we're going to have. So Scott is a, uh, the, the director of data and AI at Microsoft here in the region, uh, proven uh, enterprise leader, uh, very experienced in building high-performing teams, growing new markets, and I'd also say uh, Scott is you know, obsessed with data. Most of most of the roles he's had in his career have been around helping organizations really unlock you know, insight from from data, and he's a good friend. So welcome, Scott Fitzharris. Thanks, Kyle. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so just a couple of, uh, you know, kind of, so basically we're doing background of the introduction of the Green Software Foundation. So what is it, where did it come from, how can we participate, in, and, you know, who are participating entities as part of this? Um, there's my background. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and I'll go, and, and kind of same with, with Marsha, just for me personally, I mean, it, this is a huge area. I've been in the oil and gas market basically my in, literally entire life. My dad um, worked in Cat Cracker when I was a little kid. So I know to most people, they kind of get the smell of refinery and Cat Cracker, and they're like, oh, it's a terrible smell. I actually get goosebumps, because it reminds me of being a kid. Uh, and uh, so I have been in this industry, in this uh, energy space for my entire life. And basically what we're trying to do is obviously uh, work with all folks in the energy industry, um, you know, beyond of, you know, how can we help bring more sustainable uh, business practices. And that's kind of what we're here talking about, um, is you know, what is the vision of the, of, the, of the Green Software Foundation? And I'm gonna acknowledge, by the way, I'm probably gonna have to look at the slides because I am not an expert in this. Green Software Foundation is really very, very new. Um, and so you know, there is uh, you know, an aspect of this where we're all in a learning phase. We're all in a, how can we start doing more um, a, as part of this? Um, you know, but, it, but at the end of the day, basically what Green Software Foundation is about is how do we begin thinking about the way that we build software in a sustainable capacity? So a lot of what we talk about in today's world and sustainability relates to, especially in the Houston market, energy. And, and you know, as we think about scope one, scope two, scope three, everybody probably knows about those things. But what are we actually doing to build better software that uses legitimately less energy, or how has it become more sustainable? That's really the, the goal and the vision of the Green Software Foundation. Um, why are most people here? What are most people interested in? This has come from a, 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 a number of other series um, of things that are going on. I'll, I'll just kind of net this out. I think a lot of people are here just to learn and to start getting smarter about what is green software. Probably most people, myself included, before about three months ago, had never even thought about this. Um, but there are absolutely good reasons and, and um, ways to think about how to build more sustainable software. Um, so why do we need a foundation for this? So I'll, uh, in the next slide, personally, I have been in the data space, but actually in the open source space personally for a very long time. I spent four years with a company by the name of Hortonworks. Hortonworks 100% open source. So I firmly and strongly believe in open source technologies and how those can really change the, the, the kind of the, the makeup of the software industry. And, and these are all really, really important reasons why we need a foundation. We need to be able to protect IP. We need to be able to protect ideas, um, but also make those available for everyone that is in the market trying to make the world a better place. So how do you do all of those types of things? That is the idea of a, of a foundation. Um, and then lastly, on the increasing market size, that's one where what, what the, the, the foundation is really trying to gear towards is helping create an actual market around green software. Not necessarily a market for people to sell their software, but for uh, developers and for everyone that is m working in that uh, in that space to help you know kind of with accreditations and with you know training certifications and to be able to know and acknowledge that oh I, you know I am indeed 
a level, whatever it may be, from a developing software perspective in a, from a green and sustainable perspective. Those are the types of things um, that the Green Software Foundation is, is working on. From a structural perspective, this does go back to the Linux Foundation. So the Linux Foundation is actually the parent. This one was built not by me. If I'd have built this, it, the parent should go up on top, but whatever. So the parent foundation is, is Linux. We are going to be using numerous working groups. So those are all the different. There's a standards working group, a policy working group, um, open source, and then also a community working group to really help establish the Green Software Foundation as it moves forward um, to leverage the, the foundation um, and, and the principles from the Linux Foundation. Um, I'm not going to even try and cover this. Suffice to say, it's big, it's real, um, it is growing. So a year, uh, let me say, 15 months ago, this foundation didn't even exist. Today, this foundation now has, um, oh shoot, it's one more slide, 26 member organizations. It's in 190 countries. Um, you know, Fortune, very large companies, Microsoft, Avanade, Accenture, others, all participating as part of this foundation. Um, the steering committee members there you see there, um, GitHub, Microsoft now, um, but you know, general members as well. So lots and lots of software companies. So Shell, thank you very much for participating along with us. VMware, Aviva, there's a lot of big companies that are getting behind this. And it really does all come back to building software in a more sustainable way. This is not about necessarily trying to you know, decrease scope one, scope two by all these individual companies. These individual companies have their own sustainability initiatives. The Green Software Foundation is really about educating and putting principles in place as to how we can measure and, and reduce the, it's known as SCI, so it's the, it's the carbon index as to how much actual carbon is being used in the development of software and in the running of software. Um, so I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, member organizations, there are 26. This organization did not exist a year ago, 15 months ago. So it's going to continue actually growing. Um, and there's going to continue to be more and more emphasis um, around this and behind this organization. Whoop, whoop. There, all right, so I kind of have covered this a little bit already. Launched May of 2021. Um, there are now, it says 25 members, there's actually 29 members, um, but it just continues to grow at a pace that we can't even keep the PowerPoints updated. Um, I think the other important, por important part is the SCI was uh, published at the very end of last year. I'm gonna actually touch on that and then we're gonna have more way more intelligent people uh, talk more about what is the SCI. Um, one of the very first projects that is coming out of this is actually this summit that's going on right now. Uh, so this has been going on since the 6th of June and concludes in two days, I think, if I have my dates right. Um, and, and it is a global summit. So there are sessions just like this that are going on, not just in Houston, but across the world. Um, so. Again, the software carbon intensity factor. I'm not going to cover this, but this is the type of uh, thing and the type of um, regulations, I'm going to call it, um, that, the, that the Green Software Foundation is creating and trying to push all companies to be able to go measure the, the SCI of their software. Uh, again, I'm not going to pretend to, to know and to cover this. It is going to be covered in more detail this afternoon or this morning. Um, another, and this is probably the last thing, and this is a, this is a work in progress, um, but there is going to be a certification that is going to be coming out. And this is part of the, one of the more important you know, pieces for individuals and developers that the certification is being finalized. Hopefully, I think it's the... Uh, end of 2022 is when we're having, looking to have a million, but then there's also going to be a formalized certification process. Um, this is probably the one thing that as people take away from here, the question is going to be, how do I go about doing this? We're going to find out more de detail about that this morning. All right, I was running through that. There's my introduction, and I give a thank you. So thanks for everyone for coming, uh, and thank you for your, uh, your time and attention today. 
And I hand it off. I'm sure I'm not yep. handing this off to Kyle. <laughs> what do you mean? I used to be technical. Right? No. Uh, so thank you, Scott. I really appreciate that. Um, I always am surprised when, when you look at those 26 brands and how big and well-known they are. Um, and then I always think it's you know, quite impressive how much this foundation's been able to accomplish in 15 months and a testament to really the passion everybody in that, that group has for this and you know, how, how important it is. Uh, so I get to, to introduce our next speaker, um, Adam Jordan. So Adam is a distinguished software engineer at Shell. Uh, he also leads the Green Software Foundation movement at Shell, and he is uh, one of the organizational leads in the Green Software Foundation. So uh, Adam has over 20 years of software delivery experience across a variety of different business domains and critical software and consumer software. Um, in addition to green software, he's also leading application security across Shell, uh, and he is the lead architect for Shell Energy Americas. He has a master's in computer science, and along with a graduate uh, education in software engineering and data science. Um, Adam is also a native Houstonian and married with six kids. Check. Double check that. <laughs> right. And so when he has any free time, at, not at work or family, which I'm not expecting that's a lot, he does like to uh, play, play video games and focus on technology. So uh, please welcome Adam Jordan. Thank you. No. Everybody hear me OK? Works. OK. So uh, thanks for inviting me today to talk about the, the green software principles. Uh, I see a couple faces from yesterday and the, the Shell event. So that's good to see, but a lot of new faces. So uh, happy to be able to share this with you today. So what I want to talk about is sort of the foundations of green software. Uh, some of this is probably pretty clear, right? Reducing the carbon footprint. But actually, how do we get there? What are some of the core uh, elements of not just the green software foundation and what they're striving for, but just green software as more of a concept? Um, so I got the long introduction, so I'll kind of skip over this. Uh, I think the only relevant piece here that I want to mention is that I, I work in uh, Shell Energy Americas, which is gas and power trading at Shell in addition to renewables. I also work in subsurface modeling uh, in addition to application security. So I have a pretty good view over the businesses that we want to reduce at Shell, uh, the ones that we want to grow, and then how do we do enge good engineering. Um, and by and large, I, I am an engineer, right? So I, uh, that'll probably come out a little bit in how I talk about some of these things. Now, the, the, the core of the Green Software Foundation, the, the principle we're after, is reducing carbon, so carbon efficiency. Um, there's a lot of side benefits to be able to build sustainable software, but when we look at a measurable objective, it's primarily focused on carbon. Now, what do we mean by carbon? So carbon uh, typically is referred to in scope one, two, and three of emissions. Um, you probably heard the concepts, but unless you've been working in this space, maybe not crystal clear on what they actually mean. Uh, but when we talk about net zero for particular company, it's usually qual qualified in these types of terms. Um, scope one and two, usually directly related to a business's work. Scope three sort of be all encompassing. And so if I were to, to re-summarize this is scope one focused on the emissions directly from your, bus your business. If you are producing a product, you're manufacturing, uh, some kind of direct carbon footprint. Scope two is the energy used in those processes. Um, so you purchase electricity to build something, to run some software. For instance, if I have an on-premise data center, I have energy to run that. That might have an associated carbon footprint. Scope three is essentially everything else. So for instance, if I pick up my software workload and I now deploy it on Azure, that's not Shell, uh, that would then fall into our scope three emissions as somebody working for Shell. But this is including everything. So for instance, I come from Shell. If I sell a fuel to somebody who then runs it in their car, produces an emission, that's also part of Shell's scope three emissions. So when you talk about a company with a very wide, long supply chain like what Shell does, this can be uh, extremely extensive. And now it gives you kind of an idea of how big the problem can become to be, right? It requires really a lifestyle change really end to end. Um, so when we talk about green software, this is still the intent, though. So looking at it and then from the lens of the software we developed in a sustainable manner. So how do we actually get to that? So first is energy efficiency. So if we can just reduce the energy that's used in our software applications, uh, it can reduce the associated carbon footprint. Um, so we know the energy we use has some type of footprint, and that can be how it's produced, whether it's renewable or not, and the various different flavors of that. It can also be the infrastructure that went into it. Uh, so it takes carbon to produce a solar panel or a wind farm as well, in addition to the fossil fuels that take it. So just by reducing 
the amount of energy you reuse uh, can also reduce the carbon footprint, even for renewable sources. Um, but the next part is around carbon awareness. And so carbon awareness is where our energy actually comes from and how can we make smarter decisions based upon that. So this is a little bit of a map uh, provided by the Green Software Foundation. Actually, I've seen some, some better ones to be honest now as it starts to become much more concrete and actually be able to do something with it. And that is just by selecting the location that you want to run your software can dramatically change its footprint. Uh, so you can see some areas in here which are very black, um, like Australia. Basically, all the power there is uh, not clean. Um, and it can be dramatically different in other parts of the world. So if you have something that can be moved and just run somewhere else, it can change your footprint pretty dramatically. Um, and you can think of this as sort of an initial low-hanging fruit in terms of changing your footprint. But if you want to dig a little bit deeper, um, you can also look at the time, right? So just based on a particular day, this changes pretty frequently. And this is true most places in the world. And so the example I usually give, especially being here in Texas, is West Texas. So West Texas has a lot of wind energy. And in many times of the day, they even have too much. But of course, they don't have wind, ener wind energy all the time. So there is times where it still relies on fossil fuels. So if you can pick a time of day that then aligns where there's a lot of renewable power in the grid, not only can it help to make a better use of the power when it's available, when you actually have renewable energy on the grid, it also, also changes your footprint associated with it. And I think that's probably an important part that we talk about next, which is that time of day. Um, and so if you can align when you're actually going to deploy your software, when the energy is available, that can also prevent curtailment. So curtailment is when there's just typically too much energy in the grid, uh, usually by renewables, that then just has to be essentially thrown away. There's not a, a, an easy way to store a lot of this power now. And so until that becomes you know, economical and, and easy to do, then that's going to be the case. So we can really help optimize our footprint as really a society by making smarter decisions based upon this. But hopefully this also gives a view of it's more complicated than it might have been 10 or 20 years ago to decide when and where to deploy your software. The software itself has to become intelligent to go along with it. Um, and so it becomes makes software engineering a little bit more complicated. And so what the key piece here is around energy transition. And so I actually used this slide in one of the talks I gave at Shell because this is really, to me, Shell's story um, in that really moving from what was our business 10, 20, 30, essentially the lifespan of the company, into something that looks dramatically different. Um, and it has to occur pretty rapidly. In our case, it, it really is. But providing the renewable sources is a challenging problem. Um, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, it takes a lot of work, a lot of infrastructure. Right? The facilities are just not in place yet. So providing any tools to help optimize it, particularly over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it is really important to be able to leverage the energy we've got from those green sources. So the last point I'll talk about is hardware efficiency. And this has to do with the, the carbon footprint of the hardware that we're actually running on. So if we have a server, it has the carbon it took to produce it during some amount of operation of it, excluding the energy part, and then potentially decommissioning it at some point. Especially if you look at sort of heavy machinery and things like that nature, this can be pretty significant when you talk about embodied emissions, which is how we refer to it. Um, and so any amount of energy you take to run a software solution has an embodied carbon footprint associated with it because it's running somewhere, right? There is some piece of hardware, um, either in terms of the server you're running on or all the way back to the energy source that is related to that. <clears throat> So this gives a little bit of a view of how that can vary from a few different devices. And so if you look at, say, a smartphone, what it took to produce that device in the first place, probably significantly more than the footprint it was that was actually during the operation of it when you use it day to day. Um, that can be very different for, say, a server system where it can run for a very long period of time, it uses a lot of energy, and so the operation of it is more important. Now, they're both important in terms of reducing the overall footprint, but depending on the device we're talking about, uh, it can vary a little bit on the story on how best to approach to get the most benefits. So how do we increase the hardware efficiency? And it really just comes down to two things. And, and this one you know, is effectively pretty simple in concept, and that is we extend the lifespan. And so if we think about something like a cell phone, just keep it longer, you've increased the lifespan, increased the efficiency. Um, or the alternative is increased utilization. And so I think it's more important when we think about, say, data centers, whether it's on-premise or not, if we can just make better use of our hardware, then we're getting more out of it. We're ultimately increasing the hardware efficiency as well. 
So um, when it comes to reducing emissions, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, and I think this gets into uh, a beyond, certainly beyond uh, the individual energy efficiency, carbon efficiency, oh, and carbon awareness, but um, how do we start to handle emissions as a whole? There's a few different ways here. Uh, the first one is we just get rid of it, right? It's just something we don't need anymore, or we're going to offset it in some way, either through compensation or neutralization or removal. And so depending on, of course, the type of technology we're talking about, some of these are more favorable than others. And so now, of course, the easy solution to some of these problems is if we're just not doing something that we otherwise would have uh, in terms of, in this context, maybe running software where we just didn't need to run, that can be essentially the same of reducing the carbon footprint. And I think this question comes up a lot uh, as particularly like the cloud providers, which I'm, I'm sure there's people from Microsoft here in the room, where you move to 100% renewable data, uh, energy, that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story because it gives a lot of people a good, sort of a good feeling of, well, it's 100% renewable, so I can just keep running everything just as I do today. And it's not completely true, right? So clarifying the other half of that story is really important. Um, but at the end of the day, right, there's some physical processes that will have a carbon footprint. There's no, no way around it. The world's really built on carbon. And so how do we deal with that? And, and so that can be by removing it, compensating for it, or you know, various other processes that can be extremely technologically advanced. Um, but both of them have to be handled. So this was to talk a little bit about the, the energy grid itself and how that's going to change over time and when we feed renewables in the grid. So I talked a bit about making sure you're timing it correctly as we change this relation or the proportion between renewables and non-renewables over time. But particularly the, the in interesting concept here was around that time. So if you're producing renewable energy and you're pu putting it into the grid, uh, in some cases, that can produce renewable credits. Those renewable credits are used at a different time of the day. So if I go out and I purchase 100% renewable energy from Shell Energy, which is you can do now, by the way, um, uh, that energy that I'm producing, right, I'm actually using at my house, is not going to be 100% renewable all the time, right? Uh, that I essentially paid for 100% renewable energy. They're going to put 100% renewable energy into the grid, but it's not always going to be when I use it. And so the better I can match that up, the, the more I actually push the industry towards using renewable sources and favoring those. But of course, this is still important during transition to make sure we're tracking those. and also leads to its own set of sort of business opportunities and things of that nature that where, that of course, the more in renewable energy available, the cheaper it becomes and the easier it is to acquire it. Um, that was a little bit of the, uh, the, the matching conversation. I, I think there was one more point after this in how frequently you're matching. So are you doing monthly, weekly, daily, hourly? Such the closer we can get to being one-to-one -one with how frequently you're matching those renewable credits to when you're actually using it, the, the better off it all is. And so over time, we'll see these things start to reduce it to one. The last little bit here was around measurement. And we talked about the greenhouse gas protocol already. So, but how do we turn this into something tangible? And so I'm not going to go into the measurement yet, because I think somebody after this will actually talk a bit more about the specifics here. Um, but the one I like is the software carbon intensity scoring, which was provided by the Green Software Foundation. And it, it provides a means to be able to understand the rate of emissions for our software solutions. But to me, it's more than just a scoring as much as a bit of a strategy, right? It tells you the key components that really goes into a rate of emissions to understand the footprint of your software, taking things like neutralization out of the conversation, right? You know, what is it really taking to run my software from a hardware perspective, the energy, and where is that energy coming from? So, Pretty simple. Um, of course, it's very complicated to actually measure these things in practice, but it tells you the things to focus on, right? Um, and get, allows you to start to compare solutions, think about how to increase the efficiency. Now, over time, certainly the intent is to make these more measurable in all our environments, whether it's in our on-premise on environments that we might own, we, that we contract, um, uh, AWS, Azure, we, we, they all need to be able to provide these types of facilities, uh, certainly for a company like Shell that has to work across all of them. Um, and that they all need to essentially say the same thing, right? We need to be talking the same language when we talk about metrics or what's being calculated, how it's being calculated, because if we can't really compare them, that also is not very useful, which is why the Green Software Foundation is actually really important to this in that we can start to create some of those standards and the industry confidence in that we're all talking about the same thing whenever we do, which is also one of the key reasons why Shell decided to, to join the Green Software Foundation and has been for, I don't know, uh, since November, however many months that's been, eight or so months. I think that led to the end. I'm not sure if we're actually taking questions or not, um, but happy to take some.
There are a lot of uh, commercials now. So as a consumer and purchasing retail energy, I've seen a lot of commercials regarding green, purchase green energy from XYZ company. Yeah. You mentioned that one of the things that we can do to better align with sustainability um, is to use the green energy at the time when it is available. But how do you know if you are getting wind powered energy or solar energy into your home as an example and when you should run your washer and dryer or dishwasher, what have you. So how do you align your energy consumption to when the green energy is being, you know, provided to you via the grid? So I don't know that there's an easy facilities to do it at home. So currently what we're looking at at Shell for our software systems is what's provided by Watt Time, which is also a member of the Green Software Foundation, to then helps us predict what it's going to be, what those ratios are into the future and in five minute intervals. So, I mean, in theory, you could use the same data at home, but that's not very consumable. Um, so for, for the home, I don't have a good answer, but at least in terms of where we're taking it for our actual software solutions, that's the direction we're going. So I just have, is this on? I think it is. I just have a question for you on, you know, as a, as a business leader and as as bringing you know software, it, the cultural change that we talked about at the beginning, um, you mentioned that Shell just joined Green Software Foundation in November. Mm -hmm. um, how, how can you just give us a sense of how you feel like your organization has progressed to date? Are you do you feel like there's many of you that understand this to this degree? I'm just trying to calibrate kind of where you think you are on that on that journey and how has it accelerated in the last nine or 10 months? So in, in Shell's case, I think we're pretty unique in that Shell has a very aggressive strategy for energy, energy transition compared to other companies. And so it, it resonates very well. And, and that's why we are quickly able to adopt it on board and actually be active members in this space, um, even to contributing to some of the open source work as well. Um, and so the momentum is there, but there's a lot of people, right? So we have more than 4,000 people developing software that include the other thousands of people that facilitate delivery and all this kind of stuff. So that's going to take time to get, actually show people not just what the concepts, but how to actually do something with it. And I think that's the, f the phase we're in now. So there's plenty of appetite for it, but the more tangible things we can give, the tool, put in their toolbox, uh, the sooner the better. Uh, but the, certainly the uptake is, is good for Shell. Um, I, I don't have a good relation of how that would be for, for other companies. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Uh, all right, thank you, Adam. Please give Adam a round of applause. Thanks. <clears throat> so before I introduce the next speaker, I just wanted to encourage everybody uh, to jump out on your favorite social media platform, post about the event, whether ongoing or, or when you get home to this evening, um, and connect with each other. Because uh, that's, you know, online is also where we're going to get movement and get people to know about the Green Software Foundation and lean into it a little bit more. So I just encourage everybody to do that. So I'm excited to announce uh, our next speaker, uh, Nikki Willis. Uh, Nikki is the sustainability lead for the AWS Business Group. At Accenture, she's passionate about sustainability, innovation, and delivering a positive, you know, social impact. Um, her work includes launching new product innovations, building ecosystem partners, developing strategy for transformative market spaces, and leading global engineering projects. So, please welcome Nikki. Thank you so much for that intro, and really happy to be here today. Um, and I also just want to say, I woke up this morning with my flight being canceled, and I was really frazzled because my flight is actually a connection to an international vacation. <laughs> so not the best timing, but I want to say, you know, even just already this morning, I'm calmer, I'm excited about what we're talking about because this is such an important topic, um, and I just love talking about sustainability and technology, and my flight will figure that out later. So <laughs> it's all good. Um, but yeah, so a little bit about me. So I am representing Accenture here today. 
today. Accenture is one of the founding members of the Green Software Foundation alongside Microsoft, which we're really proud of. But I actually work um, with our AWS business group. So I'm the sustainability lead for our partnership with AWS. And that's what's really, I'm really excited about to be here interacting with Microsoft and Avanade teams because I really admire the sustainability work um, that your companies are doing um, and happy to share a little bit about what we're working on with AWS as well. So um, today, the topic that I'm going to be presenting on is about uniting technology and sustainability strategies together. And I'm actually going to pre be presenting um, some research findings from a recent report that Accenture just released, which is titled Uniting Technology and Sustainability in Early June. Um, so I have my notes here that I definitely will need to refer to just to make sure I get the statistics right. Um, but I think, you know, like many of you, um, I'm very passionate about sustainability and really in my role, I get to spend all day every day thinking about how can we embed sustainability into the technology solutions we build on AWS, but also how can we use the technology solutions to drive sustainability outcomes. So um, I'm really excited to share, um, share that with you and you know, hear, hear about um, your work as well. So um, yeah, the focus is really trying to answer you know, how can technology drive value across ESG metrics. So ESG being environmental social governance um, metrics, which we know, you know, with the creation of the Green Software Foundation and the rise of many other kind of sustainability initiatives are becoming top priority for our clients, for our partners, um, really to set ambitious sustainability goals. So the research that we did, um, it actually, it was an interviewing survey with over 560 CTOs and CIOs um, really asking, you know, what's their current state of embedding sustainability into their technology strategy. So that's some of the findings I'll be sharing um, with you today. And diving right in, I like to start with the good, the good news. Um, and I know I, I asked this yesterday, but I'm curious if any of you guys are familiar with Clifton Strength Finders assessments. Have any of you taken one of those? Okay, so a few of you. So um, what Clifton Strength Finders is, for those of you that aren't familiar, it's like a leadership personality assessment, I guess you could say. There's lots of different of these assessments out there, but the takeaway is to kind of understand yourself better so that you can be a better leader in your, in your workplace. And the way the Strength Finders assessment works is it's a strengths-oriented um, view. So it really just tries to identify out of 34 strengths, what are your top five strengths? And um, I really like that approach because it's basically the message is if we all were to spend more time making our strengths better, we would be more motivated, more enthusiastic, um, and actually stronger teams, especially if we can build teams with diverse strengths. So I've actually taken this assessment twice, and both times I have gotten the strength maximizer in my top five. So what that maximizer strength is, it means like I really like to focus on good things. I like to, to think about good things and make good things great. Like that's what lights me up. And um, you know, the opposite strength of that is restorative. People that really love to like understand problems and dissect them, understand what's causing them, and figure out how we can solve them. And I think that the message is we need both. We, we definitely need both on our teams. And I actually think it's an interesting way to think about climate education as well. Um, for some of us, like me, I like to learn about what are we doing, what progress are we making that makes me more, more motivated to do more versus I get really overwhelmed when we talk about all of the horrors kind of that are going on um, that you know is kind of the spark of why we need change. But for some people, that's what can motivate them is like, this is so dire, this is so serious, we need to, we need to work on this. Um, so I want to just explain that because I'm going to use an analogy with the strength finders to help explain some of our findings. Um, and starting with maximizer of what's good, um, technology is a great enabler of sustainability. So this is kind of something I think that we can anchor on, that we already have technology available to us. How can we leverage it even better to solve sustainability goals? Um, and I'm going to show some, some, some examples of that. Um, and here's kind of a, a, some, a list of just a few ways that technology can drive sustainability outcomes. Um, but we're certainly not limited to, to what you see here. But, um, and the good news is that in our study, CTOs and chief sustainability officers, 96% of them agree that technology is important to drive our progress in the sustainable development goals. So they agree on that. 
Um, and I guess some examples that I can bring to life. So I actually only joined Accenture last October. Um, and in that short time, I've already gotten to work on several different technology um, sustainability projects. A few examples um, in the AI space, I got to work on an industrial cluster planning platform that basically plans how can we better share infrastructure resources and heavy industry so that are geographically located near each other. Um, another AI work um, in Australia where they're using artificial intelligence to monitor the health of coral reefs and understanding you know, where are the hot spots for biggest degradation that we could focus on, how can we learn how that's impacting the speed of climate change. Um, I've also worked on a um, IoT project um, in a refinery where we have um, integrated water management into one unified platform so operators can understand where are water inefficiencies happening and how can I respond to them more accurately. Um, and more examples that I think I'll, I'll hopefully cover. But I think the message is, you know, we are already doing with our partners a lot together um, to to really leverage the power of technology to drive sustainability impact. And I hope that we can continue to do more. But the flip side, and this is where we need those restorative thinkers, you know, and I think um, hopefully so many of us in our room, in the room have that, um, there is, you know, a negative impact of the rise in technology. And that's actually a negative sustainability impact, meaning the more we're using technology, the more emissions are coming from technology itself. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think there's some common types of technology that maybe get more attention for their energy consumption, like blockchain um, and how energy intensive it is by the, the number of computing um, workloads that it, it requires. Um, the metaverse is something that's an exciting topic being, talk, being you know, growing, but what does that mean? We're actually duplicating our world into a, re a virtual world. We need to create headsets in order to be involved in that world. You know, there's actually a value chain associated with all these, the hardware that, uh, that, that, that technology runs on um, so that's more you know materials that we need to produce for that as well um, you know even training AI models there's an MIT study that shows um, training an average AI model can emit as much carbon as five American cars in its lifetime and that's maybe an average one you know some need to be highly highly accurate um, for certain reasons and maybe that's even more energy so there really are serious consequences to this growth um, it is estimated that the IT and communications technology sectors could grow um, to account for over 15% of the world's global emissions by 2040 if we don't do anything about this. It's already around 5%, less than 5% now, um, but it's growing um, in the, the wrong direction, unfortunately. So, you know, we really do believe that CIOs, CTOs, the IT teams can really put our heads together and collaborate to solve this problem um, and make our software more sustainable, which is where the Green Software Foundation comes in. And it's so exciting to collaborate um, and hear about the initiatives that the Green Software Foundation is leading um, to, to respond to this opportunity for improvement. So um, another common kind of saying that I'm hearing more and more these days, and I think Accenture agrees with, is that sustainability is the new digital. And so what that refers to is, you know, I think 10 to 15 years ago, everyone started getting really excited about the digital transformation, and we need to be on a digital journey as companies, um, which is great for you know, cloud providers and technology companies like Microsoft and AWS to, to support them on their digital journeys. But now everyone's talking about sustainability and how can we become more sustainable, which is so exciting. I mean, I feel like I'm hearing sustainability being talked about in so many meetings that, you know, maybe a few years ago, it wouldn't even have been considered in. So um, we really do believe that, you know, sustainability is the new digital, meaning every company will be on a sustainability journey by at least 2025. Many of ours that we're a part of have already started and are, um, you know, ambitiously progressing towards those goals. Um, but I think it's really exciting that we can, we can transform. And one thing to think about, you know, if we go way back to the industrial revolution and the industrial transformation, that was a really exciting time too, but where was the kind of forward thinking of what are the unintended consequences of that growth? So as we transform in this era of the sustainability transformation, I hope that it you know, is with that foresight of what are the unintended consequences of our growth in technology like we're addressing today, but also you know, how will that, that foresight um, be able to create, really change the world that we live in to be, to be more sustainable, which is exciting. Um, so 
one of the great things that I, hopefully many people know, but sustainability actually is really good for business. So, um, and you know, it really kind of has to be, I think, for it to be getting this much attention, um, there has to be some type of business upside. And the good news is there, there really um, shows data that, that sustainability is good for business. Um, between 2013 and 2020, companies with high ESG performance generated 2.6 times greater shareholder returns for their clients than those that weren't performing um, well from an ESG perspective. And I think that makes sense. You know, if we're using our resources more efficiently, um, then it's more cost effective. Um, so I think that is um, an exciting piece of the puzzle. And you know, sustainability at one point was also kind of defined with the three Ps, people, planet, and profits. Um, and I think profits is one you know, that, that is, you know, is, is, there is a way to make, it, um, to make sustainability work for all three of those Ps, and that really is the goal. Um, and hopefully technology can be a great way to do that. So um, in order for us to unite you know, our sustainability and technology strategies into one, Accenture offers this framework um, that I think is a really great way to think about you know, how can we set a sustainable, a sustainable technology strategy. So it's these three components, um, the first being how can we use technology to enable sustainability. So I think you know, some companies call that sustainability through the cloud or sustainability by technology, um, which is the, I, you know, what I love, that's that maximizer type of strength of how can we take technology, which is already good, and make it great for its application and sustainability. The second aspect being, how can we actually make the technology we use more sustainable? So this is sustainability in technology, or sustainability of the cloud, or you know, green software, um, or some of the other terms for this. And this is where I think that kind of restorative strength um, is needed, of how can we retroactively kind of look at what we're already building, understand what's causing greater emissions, and really um, respond differently to how we can design our solutions to make them, the technology themselves more sustainable. And then lastly, um, how can we drive sustainability at scale? I mean, I think we all realize, you know, action is needed and needed now, and it's needed in a big way, and we need to work together. And that's what I, again, love about the Green Software Foundation is the collaboration it's enabling, but also events like this. Um, you know, Kyle at the beginning was talking about culture um, and how can, we, how can we really build a collaborative culture together. I think that's going to be pivotal um, for us to meet our sustainability goals. And there's a strength finder strength that I think aligns to that one, which is activator. Um, and activators really are all about, you know, I don't want to talk about this, I want to start doing. Let's actually start doing things. And um, Marcia talked about that in the beginning, really concrete action, tangible action, which I think we all know will be better um, doing that together than, than individually. So sustainability by technology, sustainability in technology, and sustainability at scale, which I would offer you know, the analogy of maybe that's you know, how we can think of our strengths. So how can we maximize technology? How can we restore technology? And how can we activate together um, with our ecosystem partners? So this is just a deeper dive into that framework um, with a few examples of um, sustainability by technology. And I think I, I covered some of those um, earlier. But um, Accenture has aligned around five really key priorities um, for how we can use technology to drive sustainability outcomes and what are the areas that need the most help where technology can be an enabler. So you see them on the left being how can we use technology to advance net zero energy transitions, create a responsible value chain, um, create sustainable human experiences, which also refers to promoting sustainable choices for consumers, because we can make our kind of offerings as sustainable as possible, but consumers also need to change their behavior and how they interact. Um, how can we measure progress um, in ESG space? And then how can we ultimately build a sustainable organization? So some examples, again, of projects that I've worked on um, in the sustainability by technology space um, include we've built an e-mobility platform um, on AWS that supports the net zero energy transition. Um, what it really does is for EV drivers in Europe, it brings all charge charging um, providers into one platform instead of having a driver have to look on different apps to understand where's the nearest car, um, charge point and how can I pay for them in different apps. It's one integrated um, seamless platform really to accelerate again the e the, and, and, and encourage drivers to electrify um, their vehicles sooner for a seamless EV driving experience. For responsible value chains, I've also gotten to work on a blockchain traceability uh, project um, in the food space. So the idea it was for purchase consumers who are buying 
coffee beans to scan a QR code and understand where was this coffee bean grown, what agriculture processes were used, what logistics and transportation was used to get it here, and maybe compare that to the coffee bean you know, sitting next to it and understand how can I choose and reward kind of the, the, the companies that are um, producing and supplying their materials in the most sustainable way. Um, so that was a cool one. For sustainable consumer choices, another example, and this was included in our um, research report, um, is Levi's is doing a kind of fashion recycling platform where they can allow customers, after they've purchased an item, to actually, if they're at the end of use, if maybe they're tired of it or they, you know, it, it's just not serving their purpose anymore, they can recycle it back to Levi's so that Levi's can take that material, repurpose it into something else, um, and allow the consumer to be a part of enabling the circular economy. For sustainability measurement, um, we've built um, a solution called ESG 360, which is um, an ESG performance assessment um, that really uh, tells customers kind of how are they performing in the ESG metrics against their peers. It takes in lots of different um, third-party data, news data, c client data um, to assess you know, how are, where, where are my areas of greatest strength and where are my areas of greatest need. Um, and then for sustainable organization, um, you know, I think even events like today where we're hybrid and um, we're using technology to connect with people outside of our, our geographic vicinity can reduce on um, commuter emissions and travel um, emissions too. So enabling kind of this hybrid and virtual workforce is another example of um, sustainability by technology. So I'll cover a little bit later how we can embed sustainability in technology, um, but again, I want to emphasize the importance of sustainability at scale of working together in our ecosystems. So a few um, research findings that um, our report shared is that in 100% of the people interviewed agreed that technology is critical to responding to sustainability, um, which is really you know, a good sign, because I think if that, um, if that wasn't the case, that would be interesting. Um, but I think 100% uh, you know, agreeing on technology being critical to sustainability is great. We've also sh been able to calculate that companies that adopt sustainable technology to a significant extent achieve 4% higher ESG scores on Arabesque, which is um, an ESG rating data company. Um, and that 4% increase in their rating can actually translate to an 11% jump in ranking. So um, sustainable technology really can help improve ESG scores, um, which are becoming more important for supplier management and um, even just consumer preferences. And then I think I already mentioned the, you know, between 2013 and 2020, companies with ESG performance generating 2.6 times greater shareholder returns, which is really exciting as well. Now, the 20% um, of of our interviewees for these CTOs not being aware of the unintended consequences of um, technology if you don't embed sustainability in it um, is an interesting one. And we actually talked about this yesterday. Um, one of the people in the audience was surprised that it, the number was actually that low, um, thinking actually that more CTOs are seem to be unaware or at least aren't necessarily yet acting on it. So I want to follow up on um, if there was a second question of maybe we have 80% of CTOs that are aware of unintended consequences, but how many of that 80% are also translating that into action? Action, which is really where, um, where it matters. And unfortunately, I think there is a current intent action gap um, that needs to be, needs to be progressed. Um, but another one, and I think you know, some of this um, hopefully is, uh, is not new, but um, having about 50% of people understanding that sustainable technology can drive revenue, it can increase innovation, it can improve the customer experience, it can attract more talent to your organization. You know, um, people really are, it, it matters to them that their companies care about sustainability, especially in their technology groups, um, and then really just that it can improve your ESG performance. So, um, you know, really sustainable technology, we do believe, can definitely drive, drive this business value. Um, so, yeah, so the question of, like, um, why, why, isn't, why aren't we progressing faster? Um, because only 7% of companies have actually fully integrated their sustainability and technology strategies into one where they interconnect and intersect. Well, there is some challenges that we're all facing, and the Green Software Foundation, thankfully, is helping um, to mitigate some of these. But first and foremost, one of the challenges is a lack of industry standards um, and methodologies. This was actually a really popular topic at COP26, the um, climate change conference last 
uh, fall. Um, we're actually, you know, they're really trying to collaborate on how can we create better aligned international standards that we can all report against, we can measure against, um, so that we can really control what we are measuring rather than right now um, not being able to control it if we're not measuring it. So lack of industry standards, something needs to be fixed. But you know, as we mentioned earlier today, the Green Software Foundation in green software space working on this SCI, Software Carbon Intensity Index, is also another um, move in the right direction of us being able to unite around what is a true definition of the amount of carbon that our softwares are responsible for. Um, and so that will hopefully help to, to mitigate that first one as well. But the second piece um, being this lack of solutions. So 40% of our interviewees of the 560 believe that the right solutions are not yet available or they're not mature, including the availability of the right talent and skills to lead these initiatives. So we're still learning, you know, we're, we're still developing. Um, we have started developing solutions, but we need to be developing more and um, developing them faster to really make sure we have the, the right technology available to actually respond to to our sustainability needs. And then lastly, complexity. I mean, we're an ever-growing, interconnected, and global world. Um, so how do we, how do we manage that um, to, in order to, to advance um, together and, and actually collaborate like, like we are, the intention is? So now I'm just going to deep dive and zoom in specifically on sustainability in technology, which, you know, again, I think is a, a great focus of, of the Green Software Foundation and really asking how can we really embed sustainability into our technology strategies. So, oops. So um, the way that, you know, we've suggested in this report is really following the kind of ESG uh, guidance. So environmental, social, and governance considerations for how you can embed um, sustainability into your technology strategies. So the first being, let's embrace net zero software. Again, the Green Software Foundation being a great start. I'm really proud of how many members have joined in this past year. Um, Adam reviewed, you know, the Green Software Foundation's principles for green software being the energy efficiency, hardware efficiency, and carbon awareness considerations as we develop software. Um, I'll review in a little bit. Accenture has seven kind of priority areas to consider when you're building green software, including the software development process, how you build UI, AI, leveraging the cloud, your data comp computation, distributed ledger technology, and the infrastructure that you're using. So definitely there's some, some growing frameworks of how can we truly embrace green software. But the second component being, you know, we need to make sure we're not forgetting about the social aspects of the software that we build. And how can we make sure the software um, is as fair, as inclusive, transparent, and trustworthy from a privacy perspective um, so that people of all, of all um, types can, can, can access it. Um, some stats from the research that we interviewed, um, currently 40% of, of companies are embedding accessibility into their software. Also, 40% are appointing a chief accessibility officer. 42% um, are defining ethics, access, and usability requirements in procurement. Um, so, you know, that's that value chain impact of scope three. Um, and then 38% are conducting web accessibility audits. So, um, you know, definitely room to grow, but at least there's some momentum of, con of approaching accessibility um, considerations in our software. And then lastly, governance. Um, you know, we need to make sure we have the accountability systems um, to make sure we actually can make progress against commitments for sustainability and technology goals. So um, we believe the C, you know, CIO or CTO are critical um, for advancing and driving this. Um, and some ideas that you know, companies are already doing are 49% of them have, the, have set sustainability goals for their CIO leadership teams, um, which is a good start because that can trickle down. 50% have also set IT level sustainability goals, so they are transferring them to, the, to their teams. 49% um, are quantifying and reporting on progress from a governance perspective. And then 48% are testing all of their technology tools for sustainability. So, some, so again, some good progress, but, but more room, um, room to grow. So how can we embed sustainability in technology thinking about the ESG kind of framework of net zero, green so or net zero software, trustworthy applications, and governance um, accountability to, to make sure we're actually progressing? So what is green software? Again, I think Adam covered some of this in the Green Software Foundation's um, approach, but really it is software that you know, has a lower carbon footprint. Um, and you know, we really need to collectively design software more sustainably, develop it, and deploy it um, as well. So some of the areas 
um, that I mentioned earlier for um, consideration, and I think we're going to again hear from others later today that that are more technical and can, can deep dive these um, further. But um, first of all, thinking about you know the, the software development life cycle. So how can we actually program with more sustainable languages? How can we architect more sustainably? Um, and unfortunately, you know, in our survey, only two out of 560 companies are always taking um, sustainable software actions in their development. Unfortunately, I don't know what the list of all those actions are, but still quite a low number that are saying in every development they're embedding sustainability practices for their software. Um, you know, green UI and UX, how can we make sure we're considering screen time, screen color, um, user device sustainability, and also just designing things more efficiently to reduce screen time um, so that people are, are on their devices less. Um, I think that's probably good for mental health too. Um, so how can, we, how can we take care of that social aspect um, as well? But green AI, um, yesterday we learned from um, one of the Green Software Foundation members from Texas State that they're actually embedding the software carbon intensity index into their AI training development um, at Texas State, which is really cool um, to actually see that SCI index already in use. Um, because unfortunately, you know, there is this trade-off in the AI world of how accurate does my model need to be and how energy consumptive um, does that mean the software is and trying to reduce um, kind of the, the term, the growing term of red AI, which refers to kind of small accuracy gains for high um, increases in compute that might not necessarily um, be as efficient of a way of designing your models. Um, green cloud and data centers, I mean, you know, this is how can we work with our cloud providers um, to design things sustainably on the cloud, but also understand, you know, which um, data centers are we, are we, are we um, using in different locations to make sure um, we're optimizing where we're pulling data from, um, where we're computing. We heard a really cool concept from VM, VMware yesterday about kind of migrating cloud workloads based on time and availability um, of renewable energy powering different data centers. So there's some solutions out there that can automatically do that for you, um, but it is ultimately up to kind of the client to, 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 to make that decision of choosing to, to have those migrations um, decisions. Um, green data, you know, how can we eliminate storage waste, compress data when, we, when, when needed, um, and overall just improve workload efficiency. Um, you know, 70 to 90% of data is considered dark data, which is unused data in companies. So how can we better manage that um, and, and make our data use more sustainable? And then green um, distributed ledger technology, sorry, those are in different <laughs> order I see. Um, you know, I think blockchain, as mentioned, is, is a bit controversial of, you know, what, just admit, how can we make more informed decisions of when is it really needed and how can we design the blockchain systems to be as sustainable, maybe they're more private and permissioned um, and proof of stake versus proof of work um, to reduce on the compute time needed. And then lastly, green infrastructure. Um, I'm actually an environmental engineer by trade, and so water is really important to me as well. And I think, you know, we always talk about carbon, um, but how can we actually think about the infrastructure that we're using and how it's water dependencies from a supply chain perspective, but from a da data center perspective? Um, and ultimately, you know, how can we source things um, from companies that are developing their infrastructure in a sustainable of a way across the ESG spectrum? So lots of different considerations um, for how we can build green software. Um, and I just wanted to kind of wrap up with the, the summary of, again, this framework around how can we think about embedding sustainability um, into technology, using technology um, to drive sustainability, and then also driving sustainability at scale. So this is a framework we've used with clients. It's worked um, pretty well. Um, so you know, it might be a way to consider um, bringing back to your organizations as well. So here's a report if you want more um, information on um, the research findings that we have released. Um, but thank you so much. This is so great um, to meet all of you and be here today um, and love the collaboration that this foundation is enabling. So thank you. <laughs> so there, are there any questions for Nikki? No? All right. Thank you, Nikki. Appreciate it. So really, really great insights for us to think about. I, my, my ears definitely perked up when Nikki started talking about the third P there around profitability. I often say, like, I want to save the planet, but, you know, we, we should make a little money along the way. So, uh, but I think, it's, seriously, it's important to remember a lot of these sustainability initiatives can be ROI neutral or even ROI positive in terms of creating more efficiency or lowering cost of, you know, running a piece of software or an AI model. So, um, so now we're going to take a 15-minute break. However, I'm giving you homework. 
So I'd like everyone in the room to at least meet three people that they don't know during the break and, and find out what motivated them to come today and get involved in the Great Software Foundation. And for those on Zoom, I'd ask you to message somebody uh, on the Zoom chat as well and ask a similar question. So uh, we'll take a 15 minute break and uh, then we're gonna have a, a panel discussion. Uh, it's gonna be uh, you know, really fantastic that you're not gonna wanna miss, so all right.
All right, everybody, welcome back. I uh, hope everybody did their homework. Did everybody get meet three people? Awesome. All right. So we're going to have a panel discussion uh, now, and you guys are more than welcome to, to ask questions of the panelists. So um, as you guys know, we have uh, Nikki Willis, Adam Jordan, Marsha Trant, and Scott Fitzharris. And so we're going to have just a discussion, and it's going to be pretty open. So I'm going to kick off, though, with the first question of the panelists, and I think we'll just do this one at a time just to get started. So Nikki, I uh, wanted to ask you, you know, for those that are new, either in the audience or kind of thinking about it from a company standpoint, um, how, how should they get started learning more about this, right? So I know, you know Adam did a great job of going a little more depth, but really actually learning about how to write green software. Where, where should folks start? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think there's probably different answers, you know, company-wise versus personal. But, um, you know, I think that we mentioned the green software fundamentals, I believe, or foundations um, 101. I think that is one thing definitely um, that is a good place to start as far as really getting, you know, taking a course, getting certified, and learning what the principles of the Green Software Foundation are. Um, Accenture also actually offers kind of their own internal sustainable technology training and have trained over 70,000 of our engineers um, to be thinking about sustainability and technology. So I think from a company standpoint, I would say, you know, really starting, you know, from the leadership down, like having your CIOs think about how can we set goals in terms of sustainability for our technology groups? How can we then create systems to measure them and then how can we understand really where our baselines are um, and eventually kind of offer some of those internal trainings for, for that cultural change piece that, that you mentioned at the beginning. Great, great answer. And so Adam, I'll, I'll kind of pivot to you on just the, maybe the personal side of that, like for folks in the room that personally want to go learn more, where should they go? I think it depends on your skill set, all right? So that they're all different questions in terms of the, the energy, the hardware, and where the energy is coming from. And they require sort of different types of people in the conversation, right? So if you're an engineer learning to build energy efficient code with the right technologies and deploy in ways that can spin up and spin down, um, the carbon awareness is understanding the landscapes a bit more operational in nature, but uh, I think digging into that. And then, of course, the, the hardware, which can vary dramatically on, you know, it's more relying on a lot of vendors in that space, right? It's not a lot you can do there other than to try to optimize the landscape. Um, so, but that's of course at the, the lower level, which I guess is the question. Yep. <laughs> and and, and Marsha, how, how's Avanade thinking about this in terms of uh, incorporating this in some of the things we do or some of the services that we provide? Yeah, so um, we're trying to bring to our clients, I think Nikki talked about, uh, you know, the thinking about unintended consequences. So. One of the responsible things we're trying to help our clients do is design sustainability in from the beginning instead of reacting to the lack of it uh, as they go forward. And I think as we do that, we're, we're teaching our engineers how to think about sustainability, but we're really trying to bring to clients pragmatic ways to go forward. We're working with the Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability to uh, help clients know how to to, uh, to measure, obviously we, we only do Microsoft, so we're, we're on your platform, but um, we're really focused on giving people pragmatic ways, and then we're also doing a lot ourselves to, um, to set the pace for us as an organization, which then helps us be good consultants about how to do it, you know, so the cultural change we're talking about. So I think the idea of, you know, set the, set the objective, have the way that your own, your, you're measuring it, and then, um, <clears throat> help our clients do it. it. We're basically putting all three of those in place. And, and Scott, for you, like on the Microsoft side around, you know, training and enablement, whether it be the sales team or your clients, like what are, how, how are you thinking about that? Well, I think Marsha stole a little bit of my thun thunder with clouds for sustainability. <laughs> Thank you. She's uh, teeing it up. So it's she's teeing it up, correct. So, I mean, I think that is one, one, one initial aspect is, you know, so we just recently introduced um, the, the cloud for sustainability. Um, I'm not here, you know, pitching that, but I do think that is an area that a lot of our a lot of our customers are beginning to dip their toe into this world of what does this really mean? That's not necessarily teaching people how to develop green, you know, and sustainable software. That is actually helping our customers um, begin the measurement process. Um, how do I begin? Again, I'm a, I'm a yeah data junkie. That the, the first way of being able to make improvements is you have to measure. Uh, and so I think a lot of what our customers are trying to do initially is get their arms around what do we even need to measure? 
What's the frequency of how we, you know, how often do we measure it? What do we need to measure? Um, it, it does go back to the, you know, hey, if you're going to kind of, um, you know, kind of measure twice, cut once. Um, so keep on measuring, keep on measuring, figure out, and then you start, you know, affecting change. And, uh, but I do think that a lot of our, our, our customers and clients are in this space of, it is a top three topic. You walk into any CIO, any, any uh, you know, office, and, and you, they're going to talk about digital transformation. They're going to talk about, you know, data. Um, but then they're also sustainability is one of the top three. And, but right now, we were talking over the break that there is this massive gap between ideation and I, 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 there is interest, but action, I mean, it's a chasm um, right now. And I think that's what we're trying to help customers do is figure out how to, mm -hmm. you know, close that chasm. And don't, there is no need to boil the ocean. This really is a matter of, well, let's take baby steps. Go, go, go identify one, you know, in the, in the Houston market, identify one plant, identify maybe even, you know, one process unit, whatever it may be, identify that and focus on it and learn from that to then take it to the next and the next and the next. And, and Adam, on that kind of the thread of baby steps, you know, what, what have you guys done early on at Shell that maybe is a lessons learned or some best practices to just get started? Like, what's, what's kind of those first steps to go from zero to one? So to take any real application top to bottom and actually be able to do measurement and analyze it is difficult. And so it, it ends up being multi-prong. Uh, so one is understanding the overall footprint of the landscape and, and how can we nail that down into uh, where is that coming from, right? What's generating the carbon footprint? Um, then the individual applications that look to build more efficient code, uh, starting to build some of the pilot, find out where the energy is, where the people that really want to do this stuff, and leverage that to build the, to the use cases. Um, and then I also mentioned, so where to deploy, right? So uh, a bit of where's the best places we can get the most bang for the buck in terms of reducing the carbon footprint for our workloads. Um, and doing all, right? Because I think together they build a, a more compelling story than each individually. Um, because they're all connected, right? If you can start to make energy efficient software, deploy in the right location, then it starts to show up, show up on your enterprise radars, if you will. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions from the audience? How about you, Josh? Do you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually am interested in, because yeah, I, I come from Avanon, so I, I tend to know a lot about where Azure is in this space. Like, w w what is AWS doing to like reduce, like improve, say the efficiency in their servers, or to encourage um, the adoption of like sustainable development practices. Yeah. So um, uh, AWS, I think last November released two new offerings. One is a cloud carbon footprint calculator. I think Azure has a very similar one, um, just to allow clients to understand what is their cloud carbon footprint um, and how can they actually project it to see how is this going to help either support their sustainability goals or maybe you know how are they off track based on their cloud um, usage. So um, the carbon bucket pr pr footprint calculator is one thing. Another thing that I think, um, and you know, this is an AWS thing, but I think it can be applied broader. AWS has this well-architected framework, which is um, basically these principles to think about for every architecture. How can I think about reliability, security, et cetera? And they've just added, um, last November, a sustainability pillar, a six pillar to the well-architected framework. So um, what that is kind of encouraging is that cultural change of for every single piece of architecture, we should consider, is this aligning to sustainability best best practices. Um, and so like Accenture, for example, is developing a well-architected review so that we can be kind of a third party, um, maybe more unbiased reviewer of people that are building on AWS from that sustainability perspective. So um, yeah, I think those are, those are two things to, to highlight. Um, but I think also working with um, their partner organizations like Accenture and other startups um, to bring those so sustainability solutions to life is, is another focus for them. So Adam, I wanted to ask you as we, you know, Look at an application. Is there a quick win of just moving it to the cloud and making it greener, automa you know, kind of automatically or easily? It, it's not that simple. So you can better optimize your workload and, and leverage a lot of the cloud providers' technology out of the gate, yep. which is probably better than whatever you're doing. <laughs> um, but but that's not always true, right? So in, in our case, right, we have on-premise solutions that's 100% renewable energy that's that's highly optimized, um, and so they're, they're they're comparable in nature. 
uh, and, but that's not the norm. <laughs> so, so generally speaking, right, especially if you can tie it with modernization of your application, then it, it can make a really big difference, right? If you're just picking up your same machine, you're jumping into the cloud, and you still have to manage when you're turning it on and off and all these kind of things, you're not getting that big of a difference. Um, but if you can actually scale it up and down and containerize it and take advantage of modern de development technologies, then it becomes significant, right? And, and certainly the, the capabilities <coughs> that are available in Azure or AWS are uh, much easier, much, much more accessible than they would be you know, any of your local systems, for sure. Scott, yeah, anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, one of the things that we even do with our customers kind of even before that is, is really, and, and we inc highly encourage our customers to do an app rationalization. Um, and and, and to, to the point of, if there's 100 applications that are being run you know, today on-prem, do we really need mm -hmm. all of those? And, and I think that's um, one of the biggest bangs that, that our customers can get for their buck and move into the cloud is the, the acknowledgement and recognition that if I have 100 apps, I, I, I'd be willing to bet money that it really some percentage, 75, 80, you know, need to go and, and need to be migrated. But there's 20, 25 legacy applications that if they, if they really go start kind of pressing the business hard, they probably don't even need any more. Mm -hmm. um, or they have to really think hard about rationalization of, do, we were talking over the break, I mean, um, you know, an accounting application that's used by one individual, you know, on one day a month, you really have to start thinking pretty hard about, you know, is that an application that we even as a company need? Um, so, I, you know, I think that's, excuse me, I think that's one of the very first steps as part of this um, is just that overall rationalization effort um, yep. before you even start modernizing and containerizing and all of the above. Yep. Uh, it's really a matter of just business process wise. Can we improve our business processes um, before we even start considering moving to anywhere? And to Marsha, to expand on that, like I know, I mean, it seems like there's a pretty big linkage between reducing technical debt and, and, and you know, green software and modernizing. Um, you know, we're, when you talk to our clients, like, you know, um, to, what, what, to Scott's point around rationalization and modernization, like where are you seeing them spending money and putting focus? That really, depends a lot on the client. But I do see that clients that are really embracing transformation and are maybe a little less, you know, a little more fearless in how they're going about their cloud migration um, are taking on all of those things. And, and that's where, I mean, that, is, that helps them on sustainability, but it's like you said, I mean, it's, it also is the better economic um, Answer and and the better business business fluidity answer the better better scalability answer. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to do that, not even just sustainability. Um, so it's kind of this virtuous cycle. And there definitely are more. Um, I, I think more that are doing that now than we're doing that even a year ago or two years ago. Uh, I think that we've had so much disruption in everybody's lives in the last two years with COVID and everything changing about how many of our business models even changed, that it's really made apparent the need to go do that. So I, I think that, but there, there still is a lot of lift and shift. And you know, lift and shift to the cloud is, it's a step, but it isn't the step that's gonna necessarily help you and it's not gonna really help you on sustainability too much, maybe a little bit, if, you're, if, you're, if your on-prem isn't very good, but. <laughs> So, so Adam, I wanted to ask you more going back to the monitoring and, and, you know, and Scott said, hey, you know, measurement is a very important part to get started. You know, how did you guys, you know, set up and get started with like a good monitoring program to understand the impact of some of these investments and changes we're making? So I wouldn't say we have a good one yet. Okay. So I think that there, there's two ways we're approaching this. So one is that the, the enterprise numbers like the dashboards you're referring to to get the top down view. But the problem is you can't get that to delivery teams, right? You can't, that doesn't actually help the delivery teams day to day on actually making good decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to approach that from the other angle and that is working with the engineers to embed practices. And so what we started out with was uh, sample um, problems to actually give to engineers and say, hey, build this in the most energy, efficiency, energy efficient way and let's see what happens. Um, and so that actually produced really good results based on different technology stacks and how well they solve the problems. 
that show dramatic differences um, across the board, right? It's not just energy, but also how fast the code executes, how much it costs to run it, and all the different byproducts as well. Um, and so we're doing those approaches, sort of guidance, in lieu of having hard measurements. Um, and hopefully in the relatively short term, whether it's on our premise solutions or via the cloud providers, we can start to get that data down to delivery teams such that uh, it makes the conversation easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nikki, how about you? Like from a measurement standpoint, I know you had mentioned the calculator, but is does you know, AWS or Accenture have anything that's measuring that level of granularity that Adam's referring to? Yeah, actually, I mean, the, the AWS calculator and then Accenture has built a, a different version of it actually is at the workload level. Um, so it does kind of go, it, it'll, if, if it is trickled down to the right team members, you can actually see for, for this workload that I've built, um, you know, what, what's the carbon footprint associated with it in near time or from a reporting standpoint, there's, there's different use cases you can use for, with that data. Um, but another um, kind of measurement offering that we have that I think is interesting as far as, especially also a good place to start, it's, we call this our sustainable IT advisor. And it really is this assessment of not only your, your cloud carbon footprint, but your total IT carbon footprint um, from an organizational level. So that includes all of your end user devices, your IT team members and their um, commute time, um, your, your cloud workloads, your software that's running on, on the cloud, um, and then the infrastructure as well. So I think, you know, just like you were saying, Scott, um, baselining is is really kind of important and understanding what where you're where are you starting from so this is one offering that we have that really is supposed to say here's for your total IT footprint here's your hot spots and where, where do you need to focus um, to get started because that is that is a, a big question of, of where am I at right now to know where I want to go I, and I do think I want to interject back to, to Adam a little bit the I think there is a um, practice that that you know a lot of companies that I've been around have um, engaged in having multiple teams building the same software, but it's always been done in a matter of, of they want to understand which version of the of the software the uh, end user engages with, you know, the the highest. A and A/B testing. It's you know, A/B testing from mm -hmm. a but from a usability and from a consumption perspective. Yeah. I think there is there is that exact same corollary that you could go do, and I'll use you know kind of in the ML and AI world of let's have one team build it in R, another team build it in Python, and you know honestly take a look at the usage, take a look at the consumption. Does it provide the same output, but yet the the input to it is 50% less? You know if, if using Python possibly, mm -hmm. I should probably say R, um, <laughs> but um, whichever it may be. But to start doing that kind of A/B testing you know, using different technologies, but looking at it from an energy consumption, um, you know, perspective, or just an even overall compute consumption using, again, the SCI index. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's an important facet to start. I, and I don't think, I think people right now are just building software and so they have a baseline, but that really doesn't provide a good comparative unless you're doing that AB. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, can, I can actually add to that, right? Because I think it's a good point in that um, if you can have parallel implementations to actually give you guidance. Because, I mean, ultimately you're not going to solve the same problem twice, otherwise you have a different set of issues. But uh, if you can turn that into usable guidance to pick a different uh, design uh, or technology selection or how deep you actually need to go, especially when you talk about training of AI models of uh, you know, what's really necessary, that's when it starts to become valuable. So, Because mm -hmm. in lieu of yeah, being able to deploy, uh, develop it multiple times. Yep. <laughs> So I wanted to switch the gears a little bit and talk about, you know, kind of again, go back to the getting started. And I'll ask all of you, like, you know, if, for, for those that are sitting in this room, they, they want to get this off the ground at their company. You know, obviously, we'll kind of talk a little bit about grassroots here, but, you know, top-down leadership in organizations is often important to get things done. What, what advice would each of you have to them to go back to their companies and try to get some, something around green software off the ground? Marshall, I'll start. I'll go, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, first of all, I think the first thing is to realize that the sustainability, we've said this a number of times, the sustainability agenda is on every CEO's agenda. And at differing degrees, I mean, you have some visionaries like, like Shell where maybe they're being bolder with their ambitions and what they're stating, but everyone's getting there. I had a chance this fall to go to COP26 and there was more pub private sector participation there than there ever had been before. And then I 
had a chance to um, speak at the World Economic Forum in May, and that's just a general economic forum, but this was the topic. Everyone was talking about this. So you can feel confident that sustainability is on your CEO's agenda for sure. And I think the challenge is probably helping them understand, because they may not have thought about the green software aspect of it. They might be thinking more about, you know, uh, turning the lights off or, you know, less plastic in water bottles or something. But, you know, like they, they may have different other ideas, but this may be an angle they haven't thought of before, but they're all looking for things they can grab onto, practical things that can be done that'll help make the case. So I think if you go talk to your senior management and help them realize that this can make a big difference, show them that SCI calculator, help them understand that this is open source, this is not some, you know, you're not buying into some individual vendors. This is true, um, you know, egalitarian, what the industry is moving towards. I think you can get their support. I, I think I'd also just say, like, I think it's, it's just being that voice. Like, um, Accenture has this promise that I really admire, it's called the Accenture Sustainability Value Promise. And the promise is we want to embed sustainability into every single project that we do. And you know, Accenture is, is introducing mechanisms for how to systematize that, but it's, it's, it's hard to actually go from that vision to actual reality. And so I think you know, if you can be that voice in a project saying, have we considered what sustainability outcomes we're driving? And also have we considered are we designing the sustainability? I think that goes a long way because the more we're each that voice in every meeting, every conversation, the more people start thinking, oh, you know, we should be considering that. I should, I should be asking that question too and bringing it to other teams. And so, you know, I believe in that ripple, ripple effect, mm -hmm. and I think that's powerful. Oh, Scott, anything to add to that? Uh, I mean, not, not really. Other, other. I mean, to say, I, this is a new concept, and uh, you know, I do think there is a lot to be said for. Um, you're going to have to get buy-in from management because there's going to be um, experimentation, and there's you know there's not um, it, it's uh, I think everything in the sustainability space is new. I think green software is is even far newer than sustainability overall. So I, I do think getting that 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 buy-in, um, I think using some of the stories Green Software Foundation has, I think using some of the uh, open source technologies that have already been developed, you know, going through the training. I do think all of those aspects, um, knowing that, and again, I think a lot of folks, you can go to senior management and say, this is not just something that, you know, I, I bumped into. This is something that is sponsored by, mm -hmm. you know, Avanade, Accenture, Microsoft, Aviva, VMware, big, big names, um, you know, that, that will, that are behind this. And, and, but I do think, again, it, it, it is going to require, you know, buy-in because it's something new and new is oftentimes, you know, kind of looked at with a little bit of a squint. Um, so, um, yeah. So, so Adam, like if I'm a senior leader sitting on the other side of the table and somebody from this room hopefully comes to me and wants, you know, us to start a green software initiative, like, you know, sustainability is on my scorecard. It's important to me. I'm passionate about it. How does green software kind of rank in terms of impact to some of the other sustainability initiatives that I might have, or maybe it's impact versus effort is maybe a different way to think of it. So, so if it's already on the radar, right, that's already a, a big step, right? Um, because when what's going to cause the initial spark is not always clear, um, but there's always a, a number of side benefits to go along with it. Now, how do I look at sustainability and take that step forward uh, as a senior leader? Um, there's a, very, a variety of different angles, right, in terms of the, the measurement of it and the byproduct. So the, the, the carbon footprint, the reduction of hardware, uh, price, uh, response, compute time, it, there's a variety of different angles. And I think telling the compelling story is what makes it interesting um, because I think we've looked at these things in isolations. But I, and I think from the other side of it, right, so getting that initial spark is a lot of the same conversation. Um, you know, I think each, everybody responds to it in a bit of a different way. There's one other thing I think that you, there might be a little bit of a, some negative stories to help make the point about designing sustainability in. Like blockchain, for example, it, we mentioned that earlier. Like it's a huge technology. Most of your CEOs are probably talking about it or aware of it. And it is viewed as really bringing a lot of really good things to the table. They've been mentioned already, you know, understanding the supply chain, all this other stuff. But, you know, Ethereum 
is as a as a platform is you know like I I think one transaction on Ethereum is equivalent to nine days of the average household's use of energy. One transaction. So there's an example, right? You have new technology. It was designed. It maybe wasn't designed thinking about sustainability at all. Mm -hmm. And now we're having to kind of re redo it. A lot of companies haven't gone deep into blockchain, but that's an example of why thinking about it ahead of time, and it's probably an example that resonates maybe with your CEOs that, to realize, OK, yeah, you could, you could really be on the wrong side of this thing, and it could be expensive to redo it. All right, so we're, we're wrapping up. So I wanted to give the audience one last chance to ask any questions. All right. I, I have another question. Go ahead. Um, and so when you were talking about like the, the C-suite C -suite and like boardroom and enthusiasm for these topics, just broadly speaking, though, when because in terms of scope one, scope two, you know, I, I think of for most companies, you know, green software being kind of firmly in their scope two, mm -hmm. and um, and and in, in my mind, it seems as if most of the attention is on scope one, like they're trying to figure out how to release less methane, not necessarily how to reduce their overall electri like electricity. Usage is that accurate, or are you, are you do you feel like it's relatively like a sophisticated understanding of where they're trying to focus, or that it's balanced with their money? I think what there's a balance, right? I think in Houston there might be more focus on <laughs> methane <laughs> if you take the whole thing, but also which is a harder problem? I, I think if you were you know like there's a lot of things about you know taking carbon out of the atmosphere and that kind of thing. I mean that's a really hard engineering problem. Engineering your software in a better way with more foresight seems to me like an easier step to take if once they realize it's one of the possible things that they can do. And everyone, as Kyle said, has it on their scorecard. So they're looking for yeah. whatever wins they can get. Okay. I do think and I do think it's it's really just more of an unknown factor. I don't think people are thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, how do I develop software better um, from a sustainability. Everyone always, is always focused on you know, faster, um, mm -hmm. better. They may be thinking cheaper, but they're not thinking cheaper in the, in the, in the way that we're thinking about it from a sustainability perspective. You, know, you could even think about, uh, you know, are, there, are there better times? Are there better, um, you know, within, within you know, Azure, are there better regions for me to process and go run my ML and AI algorithms? You know, pricing is not exactly the same across all. Mm -hmm. So can I can I go train one place and an inference in another? I don't think people are really considering the 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 you know kind of sustainable costs as part of that. Mm -hmm. They're they're really just hey I need to get this done. Everyone's projects are always behind time and and so there's always such a crunch. Um, and again, I think this goes back to it has to come from leader, senior leadership to say. We want people to begin focusing on a sustainability aspect of it. And it's always going to be scope two from, from a green software perspective. It's always going to be scope two. I do think this is an area where it's just not being focused on right now because people are still trying to even understand you know, the, what scope one, two, three even mean, um, much less actually trying to tackle software problems. Most of the time they're thinking about you know, sustainable cloud type things, they're not actually thinking of building their own software in a better way. M my take on it. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I can add to that, because I, I think it's two different sort of metrics we're looking at. So in terms of what's the biggest impact today, is, is it our computing systems, generally speaking? No, right? Um, there's much uh, bigger things that need to be addressed. I think that the question is, is how does that trend over time? As, the, as we start to see reduction in a lot of what's producing the greenhouse gases, like essentially which are uh, uh, implying, is uh, going to come down, right? And as that come down, a lot of the solutions to solve those problems are technology problems. Um, and so what the landscape and what the footprint looks like for the software developing now over 5, 10, 20 years is a big unknown. And so uh, the, the way I phrase it, certainly uh, for internal to us, is we know this is a maturing piece of um, just mature software engineering, I'll put it. Um, and we need to prepare to, to be able to handle that and respond to it properly in five to 10 years as that's growing, to know how it's trending over time and bring it down, because it might, it's going to be a more significant impact in that period of time. 
So mm -hmm. essentially start preparing, right? And, and I think certainly look at the broader organization of engineers or companies that are associated with it. Big changes like sustainability take a long time. And so this is, the sooner you can get started with it, the, the more likely the impact, the more you can build the tools and the technologies to support it, have mature them, have a common language to speak. And so it's, it's a bit of a long journey. But by getting a handle on both sides of the equation, then you essentially can feel good about the problem overall. So I wanted to just give each of you a chance to, to leave the audience with a final message and then we'll wrap up. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I can say something. Um, so I guess, and not to, not to add to the boiling of the ocean, but I do think, you know, we'd spend a lot of time talking about carbon and there are other environmental and social and, and, and business benefits to sustainability as well. Um, and so I think, you know, when we're thinking about green software in particular, um, just because it's being powered by renewable energy doesn't mean, as has been said, you know, we don't need to improve the efficiency because there is, you know, those water I impacts of that data, data center is still running, still needs to be cooled. Um, there's still that equipment aspect. I just finished watching um, The Imitation Game. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that movie, but about kind of one of the first computers that was built by Alan Turing. And thankfully, our computers aren't that huge anymore with that amount of material, but there's still, you know, significant material aspects of technology. So, um, yeah, so I think just like keeping in mind that there's, there's a lot of benefits that come to um, joining a green software journey that are beyond even carbon, which is what we typically kind of think about as well. So uh, I'll add a bit of a different one, right? So I come from a software engineering background, and I think that's what, certainly where I'm passionate about. And that falls more into the energy efficiency side and just building good software. And everybody's looking for good software engineers right now. There's a, a big shortage. And that means a lot of new people also in, entering the industry that maybe have limited knowledge or they come through different means to develop these skills that will need to be upskilled and mature over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And so I think investing in people to understand how to build good software and build it not just a sustainable way, but just good design, uh, right? Because you do good design, it responds more quickly, it's more sustainable, it, it's cheaper to operate. There's a lot of good byproducts. And so it, it takes a lot of investment in people. Um, and so I think that's probably my biggest takeaway is that the, pe the engineers we're developing now at a very rapid pace are going to be key to making these things sustainable in the next five or ten years. So I guess mine is maybe it's obvious, but um, I, I think this is like a tidal wave coming uh, in terms of the need to take on these challenges, and I think that is happening. So I'm... Um, I think each of you on this seminar and everybody in the room should feel have it's always better to be a little ahead of the tidal wave than just have it come crash you and smash you in the face. And I think by all of you being here, that's a sign that you're interested in being on the right side of that and leading towards this change. Um, but I think, yeah, I think we all need to take, I think we all need to step up as leaders, as consumers, as people, employees in every aspect. Uh, to try to get ahead or you know, lead through this change. So when we cut this up and do sound bites, that's my vote for the sound bite. <laughs> don't, let the, don't let the tidal wave hit you in the face. <laughs> Smash. 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 You in the face. Yeah. I just love being last each time. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much for being last uh, each time. So right. I'll just go, my last piece is, you know, learn about the Green Software Foundation. And, and we've got 29 members today. There were zero members 15 months ago. Um, for everyone that, it, that works for a, a, a large or small organization, you know, ask about how you can get your organization, not just you, but your organization involved mm -hmm. in this. Because I think that's going to be is when we get the organizations involved is when we actually start seeing, you know, waves of change occur. So um, that's my pitch is if everyone out there, you know, can, can work on getting your organization actually involved in the Green Software Foundation, I think that will be a, a, a huge success. Mm -hmm. you, you've done such a great job being last. Like, that's, yeah. that's like, you're coming <laughs> to Thank like you. the cleanup. Hit. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So that, that concludes our panel discussion. Uh, please uh, give a round of applause to the panelists. <laughs> and if you do have any questions for them, you know, feel free to grab them at the break and, and ask those. So. All right. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it.
All right, so I'm excited to introduce our next speaker. Uh, not only is he a really good friend of mine, we've worked together for a long time. Uh, he's, he's quite an expert in applica uh, designing applications and building enterprise software. Uh, so Josh has got about 15 years of experience, a lot of that in the Microsoft ecosystem, and a lot of experience working with Azure. And you know, most recently, he is you know, taking on you know, helping us figure out you know, what our go-to-market is around you know, green software sustainability in the Microsoft Cloud. So uh, with that, uh, welcome uh, Josh Stevenson up to present. So you can tell how serious we are here at the Green Software Foundation about the, uh, the wonkiness of computing, because we believe all of you, just after our illustrious panel and just before lunch, We'll want to spend the next 30 minutes <laughs> dissecting an equation. <laughs> and I get to tell you about it. <laughs> OK, so just by show of hands so that I can see what kind of room we're working with here, how many of you are involved in day-to-day -day development or infrastructure operational activities? OK, we have a couple. Looks like four, five, six. OK. How many of you uh, are involved in product ownership or delivery management activities for a piece of software or set of applications? Yeah, a couple more. <laughs> so one of the things I'm curious about from the group that is involved in that uh, is uh, how much direct involvement there is within the product team from end users of the software. Other than, the, say, the product manager, do, you, do the devs on your team uh, have a direct line of access to their end users or the, the key stakeholders? Anybody? Okay, so that was a zero, is what I just saw. Um, so I'm going to start to, to, you know, with a little bit like further away from the actual um, specification itself. Uh, it is important to be able to measure, and we're going to go into that in great detail. But the first thing I want to talk about is um, not doing anything at all. <laughs> Generally speaking, in green sustainability contexts, the cost of doing nothing is like the planet set, is set on fire. When we're talking about software, the cost of doing nothing is that we save everybody's lives. Because what we should ultimately try to do is simply less. We heard this echoed a couple times on the panel. So a typical situation for me when I'm going to size up a system that I'm going to propose some changes to is that I sit in a room uh, and, and do an activity we call event storming. It's essentially a process map. It, it, it focuses on the business functions, the outcomes that are desired, that a software system ultimately supports, OK? So we map that out. And what's important about that, that exercise is that we get end users into the room with IT so that they can explain to each other what's going on in the system. And a typical conversation will go like this. We'll get to some portion of the business process, and then they'll, the, the IT side of the room will want to reduce it to some technical process. Like, that's when we run the batch that outputs these things that we use to email out so-and-so. And you'll be like, OK, no, 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 but that's not what I'm interested in. Why? Why are you doing that? And they're like, oh, because the salespeople need that report every day. And then you have a seller in the room who says, like, I've never, I didn't even know we got that report. <laughs> you know, years ago, they stopped paying attention to it. And yet you've got IT teams that are spending their entire lives dedicated to optimizing and systematizing and supporting and porting a report you know, generation function that no one needs. So the point of the software carbon index uh, and um, and to a, to a certain extent, the Green Software Foundation more broadly is not about actions that will neutralize or somehow like gain efficiencies within uh, a software ecosystem itself. It's about reducing the overall carbon consumption. And the easiest way to do that is to stop writing stuff that's unnecessary. We heard that about the app rationalization. That's a macro way of doing it. Within a given software application, cut out the pieces that are replicated in other software, cut out the pieces that are dead, you know, dead weight, and move on. An important thing to note about everything we're going to talk about coming, coming up is that uh, the purpose of, of the calculation is to create a hard metric that's not influenced by things that are really more marketing decisions or are built into portions of the infrastructure that are not in the control of whoever maintains the software ecosystem. So for instance, uh, carbon offsets, not really relevant here. Um, the carbon consumption can't be affected by the fact that, the, that you're buying neutralizing carbon offsets. We only want to see a, a net reduction in the pure carbon being released in the atmosphere. A further note, you're going to hear me vacillate really quickly, um, depending on how precise I'm trying to be, between the terms like, say, um, carbon 
uh, carbon dioxide equivalent uh, or carbon dioxide itself. I'm going to try and stick to carbon. Uh, what I'm, and, and the reason is because it's just an easier t catchphrase for um, carbon dioxide equivalent. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what even that means, um, methane's like 20 times more impactful in terms of greenhouse um, effects than carbon is. So, you know, if for every one molecule of methane, you have to assume like, you know, two molecules of um, carbon dioxide equivalent, or 20 molecules of carbon dioxide equivalent. So, all of the metrics are based in CO2e. Broadly speaking, um, what, the, what, what the software carbon index is trying to calculate is a rate of emission, not a total emissions, okay? So if you're looking at something like your whole estate, you're adding up how much carbon you know, was um, embodied in the equipment, you're adding how much carbon you're releasing into the atmosphere over time, um, that's, that's a really good metric. It's not what this is about. This is meant to be able to measure changes to a software ecosystem and then compare those changes um, at, you know, afterward um, you know, as you iterate over the software. Okay, so let's break this down. The metric that we care about, SCI, is about the amount of energy you're consuming in kilowatt hours, and that's important. Everything has to have like standard um, pieces of the equation. Um, the amount of, of carbon emitted um, over that runtime based on that energy, and then the amount of embodied um, carbon that's present in the system. So. A system at rest that's literally never done anything already has the cost of the servers, the networking devices, any other components that went into the technical, um, like the, the infrastructure, the metal piece of what you're doing. And then importantly, we care about that in terms of R, okay? And so we're getting into all the pieces of that equation, but that's the unit of your scale. All right, so the first thing you have to do when you're trying to apply the software carbon index <laughs> is figure out what your software is. And it's harder than you'd think. Because first of all, like the boundaries of your software, you have to figure out all the devices that encompasses. In some ways, that can be easier in the cloud. That'll be a recurring theme. Uh, the cloud simplifies a lot of this because the counting exercises are essentially built into a report in a way that sometimes, if you're running your own metal, uh, it can be harder to calculate. Because think, I mean, who knows? I don't even think we, you know, most. Uh, Data center operators know how many like switches they have, or you know, that's, that's a really hard calculation to get to. But um, it is important because all of the, 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 the metal costs go into uh, a portion of the calculation that we'll see later, which is about the embodied carbon. Okay, so functional unit. You know, within your software boundary, this is the thing that's gonna help you define it. What changes about your application that means that you're going to have to use more resources or that you will be able to use fewer? Okay, so a lot of times people want to default to user. And, and, and just as a word of caution, user is actually a really tricky place to hang the way you think about what your software is and how it scales. Because typically, what's actually driving your system and all of the downstream consequences of it um, are the API calls, okay? The user is generating API calls. I mean, this is for user-facing applications, obviously. but. Um, and, and those are what's actually scaling things up and down. They create the pub-sub follow-on effects, or they, they ultimately um, have consequences in terms of your average number of database hits based on the kinds of calls you were making. So I would, I would be real, real careful with user. Now, for more um, backend style processes, um, my recommendation would be get as low down the stack as you can and figure out what's actually um, causing your, your system to vacillate up and down. A lot of times, you can reliably um, anticipate that it's gonna be your database. When your database is getting hit more, your software is working harder. Unless, of course, it's a, it's a calculation-based thing. It's complicated, it, R, but R is important because that determines where your boundary is. So for instance, the reason we know that we can leave our dev environment out and the, and the cost of, of the, like the carbon cost of the computers that the developers are using to build the system is that the number of users or the number of API calls um, has virtually no relationship to the number of developers that have to support it. If they scaled together linearly, um, no one in here would be able to be paid. It would be the, <laughs> the worst performant financial system in the history of the world. Okay. So the heart of the um, equation is actually called operational emissions. It's the E times I where E is essentially the energy and I is the, the carbon intensity. And so we can typically get reasonable numbers about the amount of electricity that a system is consuming. That's your kilowatt hours. What's harder and, and essentially has to be created 
or either or provided. So the cloud providers, the CSPs are all getting better at providing this information. We heard earlier that AWS is, and I know for a fact Azure is, and presumably, though I don't have personal experience with it, um, if they haven't already, you know, Google, IBM, Oracle, they'll all be sure, uh, soon to follow. Um, but you have to figure out um, how much carbon is being released based on those kilowatt hours. And so if you're maintaining your own data centers, this gets really tricky because you've essentially got to determine where you're pulling your electricity from, how that electricity composition is changing over time, and then come up with a calculation that you believe will be worthwhile in, 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 this, in this equation. Next, um, we're, we're interested in embodied emissions. In, in my view, this is where um, the Green Software Foundation, the software, the, the energy behind the software carbon um, index uh, specification, uh, the industry more broadly is pro probably weakest. Like if you Google right now and try and figure out what the, well, actually Apple's probably good at this, so Apple's a bad example, but if, <laughs> for most computers, if you went out and tried to figure out what the embodied um, a carbon is in your device, I think you're gonna find it really tricky. So there's some really complicated calculators out there that'll help you do this. Um, my recommendation would be uh, stop managing your own metal and then just use it as an input into the CSP's calculators <laughs> and then move on. But the way this plays out is that um, the lifetime um, uh, emissions embodied in your asset, okay? So, if you, so you imagine this is an asset that's got a five-year life cycle. It has so much uh, um, embodied carbon at the start. You multiply that over the, uh, the, the, the to create the what's called life cycle assessment, that total time frame, that's your TE. And then you're essentially reducing that by fractions. Um, how much time did this thing run? And then while it was running, what percentage of the resources were dedicated to it? And so if we see this play out in the, in the PowerPoint here, you have like a you know, 1,000 kg total embodied. Uh, it ran for, I think it was four, one hour a day. And then it had 100% allocation on the machine. So essentially in this context, what that would mean in real world terms is you decided you were gonna run some kind of batch process. You spun it up automatically, kicked off the process, ran it for an hour, and spun the machine down. And in this wonky you know, uh, circumstance, it wasn't a virtual machine. You were somehow flipping on and off a, a server. <laughs> okay, um, I just wanna close one thing on, on the, the, the SCI. If you, start, if you start trying to get into this and try to grade your own software, one of the things you'll find is a lot of these are squishy. Microsoft themselves, as of the last time I checked, had three different internal um, metrics for um, calculating the um, uh, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent <laughs> uh, released uh, on, on their own service, you know, services. Uh, I suspect the landscape is probably similar everywhere, and there are about six different standard agencies trying to figure out how we can wrap our arms around it. My recommendation is for any of this stuff, pick a standard you like and then just stick to it because what you're most interested in, because it's a rate-based calculation, is the improvement or degradation of the rate uh, of, of uh, emissions consumption. Okay, so that's how we get to the calculation. And, and the reason why I start there before I talk about um, what we can do about it is that um, it gets back to the quote before, like if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. If you don't have a map, you can't, you can't take a long road trip to a place you've never been. It's simply impossible. And so if you start optimizing before you have a standard against which you can optimize, then you know, you're really just writing better code. That's <laughs> probably what you're doing. Um, so, Part of this is, is about the adoption of the, of, of the green engineering principles. Then you move into like measuring your, your SCI over time and then taking actions based on it. But what you'll notice in this flow is they all assume you started with knowing what your SCI is. So it's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a precondition for getting started at all. Um, there are admittedly some proxies for this that you can use as a shorthand. So if you pick the, the metric that you're reporting on in, in your CSP of choice, for example, you can, just, you can just borrow their numbers, aggregate them, and then do some of the math about reduction around timeframes, and you'll be in a pretty good place. The, 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 the folks who are gonna have the most trouble are the ones who are in their own data centers. Because if we look at um, right sizing, even the recommendations in the Green Software Foundation slides, and this one is really just culled from a material that, that, that has been presented before, it assumes you're already in virtual machines that can shift to, to app services, <laughs> which means that you've moved off the metal, you're in a virtualization, 
you moved out of virtualization in a data center or one of Shell's like as optimized as a CSP data centers into a CSP um, and now are beginning to further your modernized cloud journey. So by far the best thing you can do before you get into any of these calculations or anything like that is um, stop managing your own metal. I can't imagine a more low value task in the, in the modern IT world than um, setting, like negotiating an equipment refresh schedule with Dell. <laughs> That's, that has no outcome based value. It produces nothing. Let somebody else worry about that. And then once you've gotten off your metal, stop managing your own virtualization. Sitting around trying to figure out whether your virtual machine use is optimized across several different virtual machines is not only a, a, like a, a mindless task, but it's a but it's like a hardless, a hard mindless task, like, like valueless task. It's a hard valueless task. Most of the time, if I take a client's server uh, inventory, virtualized server inventory, and I just say, okay, I want like for like in Azure, the cost of spinning it up in Azure would, out, would outpace like five years of their operational cost of their data center because they have the space. Everyone's like, I need a big VM. It's like, okay, you need 128 gigs of RAM and we're gonna give you a huge disk, we're gonna give you, you know, all this CPU, and then they, they consistently run at about 5%. Interesting fact about computers, full stop. They're not unlike cars in this regard. As soon as you fire on a computer and you're idling it, as soon as you fire on a car and you're idling it, your efficiency is effectively zero. You're producing no work and you're burning fuel. Computers at about 80% um, CPU usage are both like safe to operate because they have room to grow and, and operating near peak efficiency, which would obviously be 100%, but that's not a computer you wanna run anything on. It's like cars. I think the optimal efficiency of a car is something around 60 miles an hour in most vehicles. And so you know, if, you, if you don't have a way of doing that, which of course the CSPs have dedicated their entire business model to doing well, um, then you're gonna, you're gonna struggle. Um, so I wanna close on, on some pieces about um, like the, this top line, which is around uh, software and, and how to do that better. So one of the things you can do as, as, a, as a writer of software, as, a, as an evaluator of software, you know, like if you're a, you know, in QA or something like that, is um, essentially create asynchronous processes. It's one of, I've, in my view, the single easiest thing someone can do, and it also has added business value. So if you take your average software package, um, it was largely designed um, as a unified whole, and then over time, all of the ancillary pieces grew, so that now it's a software ecosystem. Like someone had to had, add some EDI into it, and now there's some downstream batch processing and whatever the boundaries are. But fundamentally, it started off as this monolith, and then everyone's trying to figure out ways into that monolith. And um, so breaking that apart, you know, a lot of the times that's through um, what we call pub sub models, where rather than trying to process your request end to end, it says, hey, this request wants to be processed, I'm done. <laughs> and then that thing says, okay, hey, um, I can do this piece of that processing. And essentially what you start to do is devolve into a domain-based model. And that gives you good reusability of your software so that no one's trying to figure out how they can grapple with the monolith. Everyone gets their own domain-centered piece of, 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 of software dedicated to them. It's also helpful, helpful when you're trying to organize your development team because now they don't have to learn the monolith or the system end to end. They focus on a specific piece of the business and become business domain experts in addition to whatever they're bringing to the table as code experts. Um, and the only real consequence is that um, at the top from an architecture level, it can be really hard to wrap your hands around what the system is. And, um, and so, well, at least you've, you've got your problem in one architect instead of a whole development team. But you're more efficient, your, your business is, is operating better. And uh, you know, ultimately, I think that you're, you've got a you know, better code. So um, that's that. We've got three minutes to spare before lunch. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? Who wants to um, recite to me the, the SCI equation from memory? <laughs> okay, so for those of you um, on the, the virtual presentation, oh yeah, sorry, hey Ralph. Hey Josh, um, yeah, one thing I'm curious about is what kind of traditional software me metrics would be useful for determining the efficiency from an ener energy production, or, or I should say usage? Yeah, so um, all things being equal, 
uh, until we, we can do stuff like, like, for instance, here's an example. A proxy for um, whether your code is running, is going to run efficiently, is just whether you're writing efficient code in the first place. And so if you have a static code analyzer built into your browser, sorry, your development IDE, uh, and, and, and whatever scoring it's doing, and whatever recommendations it's making for say like how to optimize loops or rearrange um, control flow, um, all things being equal, that's just gonna consume less electricity because more, better, better written code is more efficient and it's been more efficient forever. Now, we, you know, shooting the moon would be um, in your commit, you know, like in, in, in your, your IDE tool chain there was some way of, of doing an analysis. So you can do static code analysis in the, tool, in, the, in, the, in the DevOps release pipeline, and that's already better as a proxy. But until we get to the point where we have like, down, like SCI calculations that are essentially estimating a diff and show up as a metric in a user story that some developer is now gonna dedicate their life to optimizing, <laughs> um, like efficient code is, is, is better. The other thing you can do is, um, uh, release the number of API uh, round trips you have to make. When you make the APIs, um, eliminate busy waits, and that's part of the pub sub model. So don't have, so for instance, since like on the .NET stack, since about like framework 4.5, they, they were making wide use of async and parallelization in relatively easy ways. Before then, you could write parallel code, and you could, you've been able to write parallel code in other systems for a long time but it wasn't really built into the, the language constructs to make it easy. So very few people did it. So at this point, in, the, in say like you know, the .NET Core 3 world, it's a de facto standard. So any portions of your, of your older code that you can refactor to use relatively, like minor, in, with relatively minor modifications that parallelize it are gonna be better. And then in terms of the request processing pipeline, if you, if you can avoid waiting on a round trip and instead just say log a message and then and you're not busy waiting. Because a lot of times they'll chain out like this. This is particularly bad in microservices domains. You'll have like service A fielding the, the, the first API call. And then it's essentially waiting for an ACK from a chain of responses. So I want to create user. Create user you know, is trying to you know, like, um, figure out something that it needs to validate. And while it's waiting on the validation, it has to go to somewhere else. And then it goes all the way back up. And so you've got maybe 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds <clears throat> of busy wait that you could have completely eradicated simply by saying like, hey, I have to create a user. I'm going to anticipate that this creation was successful because that's your 99.9% .9 use case. And then you just have to write software to handle it on the, on the other end. Is that a reasonable tour? <laughs> that's a lot of uh, options, but yeah. So when you mentioned like uh, anticipating like what would happen at the end, uh, say like with that API call, uh, so that would reduce most of the lat latency from what you mentioned. And uh, how do you think like that would affect like uh, software design architecture like later on? Yeah, so it, 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 there's no doubt about it. It increases complexity because now you have to figure out how to implement a push back out to the application that indicates a failure you would have otherwise caught up front. And then you have to handle that and be able to back out your changes. And my basic feeling about that is that for putting all sustainability benefits aside, okay, as if that wasn't a factor at all, that's a better experience that you're trying to create for some end user anyway. And so it's not the job of the software developer to impose how much easier it would be to do things their way on the experience of the user. It's the job of the software developer to figure out how to implement a good experience because that's what because the user is the consumer of, of, of the functionality of their system. And so it's just good old fashioned development, unfortunately. And that the, and we see that play out in a lot of different ways, like um, eventual consistency in database models. You just kind of, you just kind of have to accept it. And 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 you know, I, I would call it a sustainable development practice, but also a good practice to start to sort of build it into the way you think about the software generally. And then one quick note, I think there was a question earlier about um, knowing when to run your washer and dryer. <laughs> this, is a, this is a usability problem, okay? You shouldn't know. The button shouldn't be on, off, start. It should be like, start in the most reasonable time over the next hour. 
I'm out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, laundry needs to be done by the morning, moving on. It's, it shouldn't be something the user ever has to think about. You know? <laughs> so. Well, it's, uh, we're two minutes after. We've got people online probably want to break. We've got lunch here. Uh, we, anybody else? Thank you.